Right, well, thank you very much. I, um, this is uh, my topic uh, for today, and I certainly won't want to add any, uh, anything to uh, what uh, Michelle has said for the reasons I've indicated, because it's just going to take things away by adding. But I would like briefly to acknowledge uh, John Webster, shown here to the right in this picture, slightly skewed view. But John is uh, one of the greatest whole organisms, or was one of the greatest whole organism mycologists. And he is the man who has most strongly influenced my mycological upbringing. John, well, by, by whole organism mycologist, I mean that John recruited or published papers and was at home in every single taxonomic group of fungi. And uh, he has published fundamental work on uh, almost any of these groups. And his techniques, which he used, were recruited from a very broad range of disciplines, ecology, taxonomy, and physiology. And although I didn't meet John until uh, the year of his retirement in 1990, we did work together very closely on a one-to-one -one basis for over 15 years, making our collaboration not only the last, but also one of the longest lasting in John's uh, scientific uh, career. <clears throat> the climax of it was undoubtedly a three and a half year postdoctoral fellowship which I was able to spend with John. Uh, and this was a slightly unusual construction because John was long retired by then, but it was made possible by the generosity of a private benefactor, the late Philip Booth. And I think this picture conveys a, a, a glimpse of the sense of excitement and discovery which we shared throughout this marvellous period in the late 1990s in Exeter. Later on, John and I focused our attention to revisions of his uh, international textbook on fungi, Introduction to Fungi it's called, and we wrote the joint third edition of it which was published in uh, 2007. And here is a copy of it. Oh, incidentally, Mirete, here are your sunglasses as well. <laughs> <laughs> here is a copy of it uh, as a gift to the uh, department here at uh, Orslev or any other place where students might have access to it. So uh, John was very keen on, on teaching and he was also keen for me to get involved in teaching mycology. So John was actually quite disappointed when I turned down a senior academic position in Germany um, a few years ago. He would have liked me to uh, be at university to teach. But I don't think anyone was more pleased than John when, the news, uh, when he heard the news of my affiliation to our university. And it was very satisfying for me that John heard these news just a few weeks before he died on the 27th of December last year at the age of 89. So John Webster is a very good reason for me to be here today. A second um, valid reason, I think, is that it simply makes sense for our institutions, the Esterborg Center in Northern Germany and ours University, uh, AU Food, to collaborate. Uh, we share a similar climate, and as I hope I'll be able to demonstrate in my lecture, we also share uh, similar diseases. In fact, um, there is much more in common, well, there's much more in common in terms of diseases between Northern Germany and uh, Denmark, for instance, than, say, between Northern and Southern Germany. But we also have a common history. This is a fairly recent map of Denmark, <laughs> and it, um, it shows that not too long ago, Denmark extended right down to the northern shore of the Lower Elbe River. <laughs> Our fruit production region, of course, the Altes Land, is just south of that river. So in those days, we would have been able to throw a stone, or if you like, an apple, from, uh, from a northern German orchard onto Danish soil. For nearly one century, we needn't have bothered, because even our region down here was under Scandinavian administration, sometime Danish, for the prolonged period Swedish. And um, this is a picture of uh, Stade, which was the provincial capital of the, the Scandinavian territories at the time. It's still a beautiful city today, and many of its finest buildings date back to the Scandinavian administration. So um, I think it is fair to say, without really wanting to get too deep into history, I think it's fair to say that the northern Germans in the 17th century fared rather better under Scandinavian rule than some Scandinavian peoples did under German occupation more recently. <laughs> but I, I think this is not the time to mention the war, so perhaps we should, we should, retreat, to the safe, should retreat to the safe haven of plantosology. So what do we mean, or what do I mean when I say whole organism mycology is an important discipline? Uh, it can of course be applied to plant pathology and my approach 
is to do is a three-step procedure. First of all, we need to identify the disease we're working on. And this applies not only to new diseases, uh, about which I'm going to talk quite a bit in my lecture, but also to established diseases, because I'll show uh, on a few examples that sometimes people get their identification even of existing pathogens wrong. And it is important to get a proper, valid and sound identification because the Latin name of a fungus is the key with which we can unlock literature which might have been written about this uh, fungus elsewhere. Even if literature is available, we still need to complement the literature knowledge by own observations because it may be that the fungus behaves differently in our climates than it does may, maybe in uh, South, South Africa or North America. So we need to establish key facts. Where, did the fungus, where does the fungus overwinter? When does it infect? How does it infect? And only once we've got these key facts right are we able to conduct meaningful trials with the aim of making recommendations to fruit farmers. And I think whole organism mycology has a role to play in, in horticultural research because my observations of research in horticulture is that we have two groups of scientists working alongside each other without actually being aware of each other's existence. There are the fundamentalists working at universities. They usually work on, uh, with molecular biological methods on very deeply on particular aspects of particular fungi. And we often don't see the relevance in terms of horticulture. And then there are the trialists who spray something against something and then they hope that they achieve some level of control. And I think whole organism mycology can bring together these two separate disciplines. And that's the third reason for me to be here today. I'll focus on uh, apple diseases, first of all, because apples are the most important uh, fruit crop in Europe. And secondly, because apple trees are being managed for anything from 15 to 30 years. And therefore, there's plenty of time for fungal diseases to build up and cause problems. And I'm going particularly to talk about diseases which infect apple fruits late, just before harvest or even after harvest, or which become visible at that time, at those times because they are the ones that cause potentially the greatest economic damage by becoming visible after the farmer has already spent a lot of time and money on trying to control them. This is the first disease I would like to talk about. It's called sooty blotch disease. And you can see a badly affected crop here. It's an organic crop. And it is easy to uh, imagine that apples of this kind uh, are, have to be downgraded from table apple use to industrial use, and that's associated with a loss of up to 90% of their value. Still, the question is being asked sometimes whether sooty blotch is actually a disease at all, because all it does is to form a layer on the outside of the apple fruit, on the epidermis. The layer uh, is visible because the hyphae of the fungi which cause it are darkly pigmented, so it appears green as if covered by algae, but the fruit underneath it remains physiologically intact. So strictly speaking, it's not a disease in the sense that the fruit is not damaged. Nonetheless, fruit farmers agree that it is a disease, and um, I, I'm quite happy to go along with that, um, because um, the economic damage is quite, can be quite serious. It's a very interesting disease. It's in fact a disease complex. There are over 80 species which have been so far found to cause sooty blotch. And it is of great relevance, of course, to know which one is responsible in our uh, climate. There is a similar thing called flyspeck disease, which I'm just going to mention without going into too much detail. And that's caused by a fungus, a single species, Chrysotherium pomi, which produces hyaline hyphae, so you don't see the hyphae, but you do see the fruit bodies which appear as dark spots, and so it looks like a fly has been doing its business on this fruit. There has been a very um, prolonged, intensive collaboration between the Esterborg Center and the KOB, the Competent Center for Fruit Production in Bavendorf, near Lake Constance in southern Germany, for five years we've been tormenting ourselves with this disease and I'm going to summarize a few aspects of it in my lecture. It's actually the first time uh, I'm, I'm presenting these data anywhere because they are very complex and it's taken a long time to work them out. So sooty blotch disease is by no means limited to apples. Um, you can find sooty blotch fungi on a very great range of other crops um, and it is a, a lovely playground for taxonomists and for biodiversity people because you can find different fungi on different hosts and you can do all sorts of wonderful studies. This is just in passing. These are just photographs which I've taken from sooty blotch, of sooty blotch fungi growing elsewhere. 
uh, in the course of our project, we conducted a very extensive survey of approximately 15 orchards in each of these two regions, and they were visited each time for four years. Well, actually for five years, but I'm presenting the key data, the core data here. And this shows the percentage of orchards harboring particular fungi which were associated with sooty blotch disease. And we can see at one glance that one fungus, Peltaster serophilus, was dominant in both southern Germany and in northern Germany in all these four years of the survey. In fact, this presentation, th this, this uh, slide, rather understates the importance of Peltaster because if you uh, express the dominance of Peltaster in terms of percentage of sooty blotch area in total, then we would be able to say that over 80% of all sooty blotch spots are caused by this one fungus alone. There are others, for example, Cyphelophora sessilis as one of the more important ones in southern Germany, and it seemed to be growing in importance. We'll come back briefly to it later. And in northern Germany, Microcyclosporella mali as the second most common um, sooty blotch fungus. When we started off our collaboration uh, in uh, Orslev, and I, I had to look it, back, look it up as well, Michelle, it was back in 2008. So really, all those years ago, it's lost in the mist of time almost. But anyway, we, I saw some sooty blotch fungi here at Orslev, and I took them back and um, had a look at them. And the Danish species, which I found here, uh, the, the Danish picture was very similar to the northern German one. So Peltasta being the, um, being the prominent, the dominant species, and Microcyclosporella mali also being found. Marianne tells me that Chrysotherium pomi, which I find in northern Germany, is also present at Orslev sometimes. So, again, we have this similarity between the northern German situation and Orslev. To summarize this very, very extensive collaboration in just one slide, this is what I would say. There are some publications still in progress. They've been written, but not yet submitted. It's very difficult to evaluate it all. We found altogether 19 species in Germany, and t uh, which were identified by molecular, biological methods, and also by microscopical methods, cultivation, and so on. And of these 19 species, 12 seem to be new to science. They have not been reported before. And we are about to publish some of those. 80% of the lesions or more are caused by one fungus, and that's the important bit. And Peltasta is also dominant in Denmark. So really, we can focus on one fungus if we want to control sooty blotch disease. Now I'm happy. Oh, here we are. So um, where does Peltasta occur? In terms of production form, it's highest in uh, trees which are totally untreated, for example, in gardens. Um, it is of medium occurrence in trees under organic management and it is low or absent in uh, trees under integrated production where synthetic chemical fungicides can be used. As far as the region is concerned, my impression is that it is strongest in southern Germany, especially in certain years. It's of medium importance in northern Germany and it seems to be generally uh, of lower importance in Denmark. That has something to do with temperature. And time is another parameter, another dimension which we need to look at. Um, sooty blotch fungi are most common on the latest cultivars, on those which hang on the trees for the longest. It is, it is of medium importance on the early main cultivars, by those I mean um, varieties such as Elstar. And it is absent on the early cultivars such as um, Gravenstein. That's simply got something to do with the time which the apples hang on the tree and can be colonized. Time is not the only aspect uh, which comes into the equation, though. This is a, f a shot which I took on the 6th of October in southern Germany, and you can see this test variety Luna being densely covered by Peltaster. A photograph of another uh, variety, Ariane, shows that Peltaster was absent from these fruits, although they were grown a few trees further on in the same orchard. And that's a variety-specific phenomenon, and it has something to do with the waxy bloom which is typical of this particular variety. A waxy bloom seems to deter Peltaster serophilus, although it can encourage certain other sooty blotch fungi. But as long as these are not dominant or frequent, this would be a way to control sooty blotch. Another thing which you don't really want to encourage, but which is still a, a factor, is russeting. You will never see sooty blotch fungi on russeted areas of an apple. So if you have a totally russet variety, such as Egremont russet, an old English variety, you would expect this to be free from sooty blotch. <clears throat> we now inexorably move to infection biological aspects of sooty blotch disease, of Peltaster. And this uh, photograph here shows several observations which will allow us to make conclusions 
tentative conclusions, at least as far as infection bi biological matters uh, is concerned. I've bent this twig slightly upwards so that the fruit mummy, which used to be directly attached to the fruit surface, is bent upwards a little bit. And underneath we can see um, a sooty blotch colony, which presumably was the initial infection. Um, <clears throat> so I observe that quite frequently, that uh, sooty blotch disease is visually associated with fruit mummies on trees. And I was able to confirm this by removing fruit mummies from heavily infected trees, suspending them over um, uh, apples which were free from sooty blotch, which I bought somewhere in a shop, or maybe took out of our storerooms, never mind. And um, then by watering them every day for four weeks, I was just about able to see the first signs of sooty blotch. I couldn't keep these fruits for any longer because they would just start rotting. But I was able to induce sooty blotch lesions and I could isolate the fungus and identify it as Peltaster serophilus. So we can prove that fruit mummies are a source of inoculum for this disease. And the other thing on this fruit concerns this part here. Quite obviously, there was a rundown of inoculum with water from this uh, initial infection, and where the water drops gathered at the bottom of the fruit, we could see further uh, infections, further sooty blotch lesions. So this is an indication that uh, Peltaster has a polycyclic infection biology. It is able to infect a fruit, form spores in the fruit, which can then wash down and can cause further infections. So it can infect repeatedly, maybe throughout the season. And I'm going to talk about these two aspects very briefly in my next two slides. If fruit mummies are a source of inoculum of Peltaster, then removing fruit mummies might control the disease, provided that fruit mummies are important enough. And this is a very extensive trial conducted at, uh, at the Esterbock Centre, uh, which shows that this was the case. So we had an orchard which, which was uh, managed in its entirety according to organic principles, and um, where we had removed the fruit mummies, we could see a very clear and statistically significant drop in the uh, development of um, sooty blotch. This is an experiment conducted by my colleagues <coughs> in southern Germany, and they were... Uh, wrapping up fruits in uh, waxed paper to protect them from rain and, of course, from sooty blotch inoculum. And when these fruits were wrapped until, um, after flowering until early August, very little sooty blotch disease was, uh, was found at harvest. By removing the wrapping successively earlier, there was a gradual, <coughs> and the emphasis lies on gradual, a gradual increase in sooty blotch severity up to the point where the fruits were totally unwrapped, uh, un totally free. In, um, in, in, uh, this concurs with the notion that um, we have a polycyclic disease that at any time of the season, infections can principally occur. We don't have a situation in which ascospores are released only in autumn, uh, in spring, sorry, and uh, uh, infections can take place only at that, in that limited period, which we do have for other sooty blotch fungi. <coughs> Um, we observed in this experiment that the waxed paper um, was also colonized by sooty blotch fungi. And this observation is important for two reasons. First of all, if you suspend waxed paper in trees and it becomes colonized by sooty blotch fungi, then quite obviously it is just the surface which the sooty blotch fungus needs for colonization. And that is in contrast to current theories concerning sooty blotch fungi, where it is speculated that they need exudates in the form of sugars or amino acids and so on from the fruits. If we just suspend paper in the uh, trees and we get sooty blotch, then uh, this puts such a theory at rest. And we can, if, if that is so, we then have a bait in which we can check um, for the occurrence of sooty blotch fungi in an orchard outside the vegetation period, when we have no apple fruits on the trees. And we did that by suspending this waxed paper uh, at various uh, time points and then collecting it one year later. So paper which had been uh, suspended uh, at, from late November onwards until October of the following year was densely colonized by sooty blotch. Paper suspended from end of March onwards, less so, and paper suspended from uh, early May or late May, uh, yet uh, less uh, colonies on them, on it. So quite apparently, um, it, is, well, it is apparent that um, inoculum of, sooty blotch, of the sooty blotch fungus Peltastis serophilus can be released also during winter. And of course I isolate the fungus and check that it was indeed Peltastis serophilus. So inoculum seems to be present all year round. <clears throat> if that is so, if inoculum of Peltastis is present even before bud break, for example, in spring, then it might be possible to treat 
our trees with harsh fungicides, which we wouldn't otherwise use in organic orchards. For example, um, slate lime, and also lime sulfur treatments at high doses. And the question is, if we spray the trees, if we cover the trees with a kind of sanitation spray before bud break or before flowering, do we manage to eliminate sooty blotch from the trees and do we manage to avoid sprays later in the season? And the answer is, um, well, a resounding yes and no. Um, yes in the sense that we manage to delay the onset of the disease by about two weeks and no in the sense that you don't see these differences anymore at harvest. So, <clears throat> we do need to spray uh, during the season. And it is apparent from this slide here that if you spray throughout the season, you do get um, a stronger reduction of sooty blotch than if you spray only either in the first half of the season or in the second half of the season. And this just shows the accumulation of sooty blotch at three different time points, uh, mid-July, early August, and then at harvest. The two fungicides, the two organic, or the two fungicides suitable for organic production, which are effective against um, sooty blotch, against peltaster, are lime sulfur and potassium bicarbonate. Those are the ones in our trials which were found to be most effective. And the bottom line is, and that's directly due to the infection biology of peltaster, that we need repeated sprays throughout the season under severe uh, infection pressure to control this disease. And that's a bit of a blow. We had hoped that um, we would find ways to control sooty blotch by reduced fungicide applications in organic fruit production. And the uh, real reason why we are struggling with sooty blotch is that um, we find it particularly in organic orchards planted with scab resistant varieties. Because these apple or these apple cultivars with a resistance against scab have been bred and introduced into organic farming to reduce the number of fungicide applications. But if you do that, then you suddenly get sooty blotch. So uh, really, the, these um, uh, sooty blotch can be a nail in the coffin of scab-resistant variety breeding. And that's because of the particular infection biology of this fungus here, of Peltaster. So which options do we have? Well, we have to spray uh, throughout the season, maybe at reduced uh, intervals, uh, prolonged intervals, but we do need to cover sooty blotch by fungicide sprays in organic farming. We have other options. I've mentioned the removal of fruit mummies, and you could also try to prune trees to generate a more open canopy, which improves aeration, and you could try to plant less susceptible varieties, for example, those um, which have this waxy bloom. <clears throat> so much about sooty blotch, and I won't want to move on until I've um, uh, acknowledged people with whom I've collaborated intensively, from the Bavendorf Institute, um, from Iowa State University in terms of taxonomy, and also from the SBOC Center itself in the uh, organic consultancy service. We could just look at a few more slides in passing. There is, I can resist almost anything except temptation. And um, this is a case which tempts me greatly. Uh, you can see that I, I just, nothing, no, one, no one knows anything about the ecology of sooty blotch fungi. Um, and we can see that they form a substrate which is grazed by slugs and snails. <laughs> Well, of course, one could say this is a very good bioremediation uh, way to, to, uh, to uh, clean or clear apples of sooty blotch, but that's not the aim why I show this slide. Much rather, I just wonder what part, which, which role sooty blotch fungi play in the food chain. What you certainly can see is that you can certainly say something about the biology of mollusks, because you do see these trails of slug grazing on apples hanging as high up as two meters on the tree. So these things must come out at night and graze. I've never seen one so high up, but they must be there. Um, sooty blotch, the sooty blotch coverage here also could form a substrate for other fungi. Um, Trichothecium roseum growing here on an apple which I picked from a tree. And uh, this is a mycoparasitic fungus, a hyperparasite. So uh, there is obviously an interaction between different fungi. And I also have some evidence that another fungus is involved in the formation of this sooty blotch layer because I consistently isolate other fungi in addition to sooty blotch from these layers. But that's a different story. What happens to sooty blotch fungi after harvest? Well, with peltaster, we can say quite for, with some certainty that the uh, colonies lose their viability quite soon. So you can isolate uh, peltaster from about 55% of the colonies. That's quite a high rate, actually, because it's bloody difficult to isolate these fungi. And this rate goes down very quickly after 10 weeks of storage, and then after nine months, you can't isolate peltaster from any colony anymore. 
and the colonies don't spread either. In contrast, you see a strong surge in other fungi, and Penicillium expansum will be treated again later when we come to storage rots. Cyphelophora sessilis, which is the uh, fungus of growing importance in southern Germany, has a different property that can actually grow and expand during storage. So we need to get our taxonomy right in order to uh, understand how we can control these diseases. I also often see gradients of sooty blotch in uh, orchards, which I examine. This is the, an orchard, a Darling Bell orchard in the uh, Esterburg Center. And for years, there's been a, a, a focus of sooty blotch in this northwestern corner, but there's no obvious reason uh, related to the current um, uh, fields, the, the, plant the planting of fields, adjacent fields in their current state. There was an old unmanaged orchard when this was planted about 10 years ago, and that was uprooted. And maybe this orchard still remembers the uh, focus of inoculum. So gradually, the disease seems to have spread, but um, I can see the same gradient year in, year out. We've seen that fruit mummies um, are a source of inoculum for Peltasta. And we will see this theme recurring to us uh, as we move through my lecture today. And that's why I'm going to talk a little bit about fruit mummies at this stage, so that I don't need to repeat it um, later. Fruit mummies are very attractive to fungi. They form dead material, which is available for colonization, and they are suspended in trees for prolonged periods. Here we see a fruit mummy formed just after Flowering, this one presumably during the June drops, and this one at some stage between the June drops and harvest. And um, fruit mummies are attractive because they can stay or remain on the trees for well over one year. So they allow the fungus to complete its, its uh, developmental cycle. And they are, of course, in very convenient proximity to developing new fruits and fruit mummies. So I was interested in devising, uh, developing a method which would allow me to... Um, to quantify the presence of fungi on fruit mummies. And it's actually quite a simple method. You just need to take fruit mummies, place them in a bit of water, in this case one and a half milliliters, in a 24 well plate. And after a half an hour or more, you can pipette off the uh, suspension, the spore suspension, and do some microscopy. And if you know your fungi, then you'll very quickly manage to identify them. It needs a bit of practice. There are advantages to this method. For instance, it's a high throughput screening. You can actually test quite a few mummies from one orchard in a relatively short time. And you get, uh, the, the fruit mummies are very small, so it's quite easy to sample them. You can ask colleagues elsewhere uh, to pick mummies and send them to you by post, or if necessary, they are small enough to be smuggled through customs. Um, and you also, if you're fortunate enough to have a PhD student called Peter Maxine, who also works on his fruit web and who travels all over Northwestern Europe, <laughs> To, ma to, to manage his weather stations, then it's a relatively easy matter for him to pick a few fruit mummies for examination. And these are just a few sp uh, spores of a few of the pathogenic fungi, all of which we're going to talk about later, which you can find on fruit mummies. And in fact, these photographs were taken uh, from these fruit mummy samples. But you can do more than that with the method. You can, for example, quantify the release of spores. So by pipetting, by taking samples every few seconds or minutes, we can see that this fungus here, Facidio pycnis, releases all its preformed spores within about 15 minutes of a mummy being rehydrated. So in this case, a very short shower would be sufficient to release large numbers of spores, on average about 19 million per fruit mummy. This fungus here, Diplodia seriata, release, releases its spores rather more sluggishly. It takes about two and a half or three hours to release 340,000 spores. But these spores are about 200 times bigger than these in terms of volume. So the biomass is actually quite similar. <clears throat> It'd be nice to correlate these dynamics of spore release with the infection biology, but um, I need a few more lifetimes to get all this done. And I'm going to talk about these two fungi here, Facidio pycnis and Diplodia, uh, in their turn um, in the next two sections, starting with Diplodia. I think Peter Maxine will remember this slide. It was taken on the 23rd of August 2007, when an organic, uh, organic fruit farmer from northern Germany came up to us and expressed his disgust at uh, storage rots taking away his apples even before harvest. Um, we found that quite amazing too, and so I examined the matter, the matter further to check what was going on. First of all, looking at the symptoms, <coughs> there appeared to be a two-stage infection process. Uh, at first, there were some black, sunken, limited lesions 
um, which were a bit spongy in, uh, in consistency, and consistency. And from those lesions onwards, uh, outwards, there was a, a secondary rot um, which spread only as the fruits reached maturity or approached maturity. Um, the fungus was relatively easily identified as Diplodia seriata based on its very large and uh, very um, strikingly shaped and coloured spores. It has several different names and they are of course important not so much for uh, reasons of torturing students, but they are important if you want to look up what has been written about this fungus in literature because of the eventful taxonomic prehistory it has witnessed several name changes. Uh, a quick look at the affected orchards. This disease was new to us at the time and we had a look at the orchards where it appeared in the harvest of 2007. <coughs> a look at the orchards showed that it was present on several other uh, niches or organs of the affected apple trees as well. For instance, as leaf spots and some plant pathologists gifted obviously with a lively imagination they called this symptom frog eye leaf spot. I find it a bit annoying that it is in my own name because it's a good one. Um, <laughs> Bark necrosis I found very rarely, but it is known to be a major source of inoculum in North America. In northern Germany, it's very rare. But what we did find was that the fungus, and of course you will uh, find that history repeats itself, the fungus was extremely common on fruit mummies. And focusing on the fruit mummies, which were very densely colonized um, uh, on trees affected by, uh, by black rot, um, I was able to observe the uh, disease in full swing the next year. On the 3rd of July 2008 we had a big thunderstorm in the Esterburg orchard and you can just see how the spores were washed off as a kind of black haze here from an overwintered fruit mummy on this Darling Bell uh, apple. A few hours later these spores showed signs of germination. You can see the germ tubes here. About four or five days later we could see the first black spots surrounded by red halo um, <coughs> associated with lenticels, which are natural openings in the apple fruit surface. And then about 14 days later, we have this primary lesion, which then stopped developing for about six weeks until the secondary rot uh, emerged uh, just before harvest. Fruit mummies. Well, we've heard the story before, and in the same orchard where we did our experiment on uh, sooty blotch, we also fo were fortunate enough to have black rot. Um, the fruit farmer wasn't fortunate, but we were. And we were able to, to uh, assess this, uh, this um, orchard also the, uh, for the development of, uh, development of black rot in um, subplots where fruit mummies had been removed. And we could see a very clear and statistically significant effect of fruit mummy removal on black rot. So by removing fruit mummies, you might kill more than, or more than one bird, uh, birds with one stone, or in this case, uh, more than one pathogen with one measure. I've talked about um, <coughs> people going out to collect fruit mummies, and this is the first result um, of Diplodia seriata, which um, we were able to publish in Fricto Grund. Um, it shows that um, south of the Elbe River, um, the uh, share of fruit mummies affected by black rot by Diplodia was very high. From uh, the former border of Denmark upwards, um, the um, uh, percentage was very low, so in Schleswig-Holstein and in Denmark itself, and it was virtually absent from um, other former regions of Denmark, the Scanian provinces here. As far as um, fruit rot is concerned, it is entirely absent for all I know from Danish organic apple production. It is found only on organic fruits in northern Germany, but there it might well cause losses of 5 to 10 percent before harvest. And it is, if you want to find an integrate production, you need to travel to central or southern France where it shows an increasing gradient the further south you go. And um, this is, it can be correlated with the very high temperature optimum of this fungus for infection. It needs temperatures well above 20 degrees to infect fruits or developing fruit mummies. And in fact, um, it's the emergence of this disease in northern Germany during the last um, eight years or so is one of the clearest evidences we have uh, for the effects of climate change on uh, fungal pathogens. So it'll be very interesting to see when it um, finally emerges in Denmark as a, a relevant disease. We already have it in our orchards. <clears throat> so much about Diplodia. And just one further disease before I, I'll take a little break and pass on the microphone or the, uh, this thing here to someone else. 
rubbery rot uh, as a disease in, uh, which is also relevant in Denmark. Now, Diplodia is a, entirely a pre-harvest disease. You will find it before harvest, but it will not develop in storage. It's too cold for Diplodia in storage. If you take diseased fruits and you put them into storage, the, the lesions will not grow. They will just stay the way they are. This one's different. I personally think it's quite a beautiful fungus, but um, <laughs> beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder, and I have had fruit farmers who disagree with me very strongly. <laughs> This is a little, uh, the first example of a spot the rot contest. And uh, you are invited to spot how many uh, rotten fruits there are in this picture. Altogether five. And they're very, very difficult to spot for two reasons. First of all, because they're very pale in colour when they come from ultra-low oxygen storage. And secondly, because the fruit rot is very firm. So much so that with some confidence I can take a fruit like this and I can drop it onto the floor without needing uh, some cloth or whatever to wipe up the mess. very firm and remains intact. It might bounce once or twice, but it will not splash. <laughs> and you, I can, you can have a look if you want. There's nothing like um, uh, playing with rots. <laughs> now, this rot is a very interesting one because um, it is very changeable. Um, it, um, when you take it out of ultra-low oxygen storage, it's very pale. When you then continue to store it in, uh, in normal cold rooms under ambient atmosphere, it will gradually develop a black pigment in the course of two to four weeks. And that's because this fungus produces melanin, which is a fungal pigment. And this is the biosynthesis of melanin requires free oxygen, free atmospheric oxygen. For several reasons... Oh, sorry, yes. First of all, I, I, I was struggling to identify this fungus. Uh, even though it produces very nice spores, they look like rugby football, footballs with two big lipid droplets in them, uh, I just couldn't for my life find a description of it in any uh, compendium of storage rots or uh, fungal taxon taxonomy books. The reason became clearer uh, as I finally uh, turned to molecular biological methods to identify it, simply because the fungus has not been described until very recently. So it really is in worldwide a new rot. Uh, it was described first in 2005 by Chow and colleagues in North America, and they speculate that it might have been back as far as the 2002 harvest. I first found it for sure in the 2007 harvest in northern Germany, but again we have evidence that it must have existed at least for a few years previously, and some farmers say, once they've seen me uh, showing them a, 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 an infected fruit, they'll say, oh yes, we've had that for the last 20 years. Um, for, for this reason and for other reasons, I believe that it is actually, it has been present in Europe uh, for some time, but it has been unnoticed. Why could that happen, or how could that happen? Well, it can be confused. Both stages of this rot, the pale stage from ultra-low oxygen and the black stage in uh, atmospheric uh, storage conditions, can be confused with lookalikes. And I myself, when I first saw this, confused it, or thought it was a Phytophthora rot. And I was struggling to isolate Phytophthora, just couldn't manage it. I always found something else. And um, likewise, the, uh, and you'll see that in the display later, which we've uh, placed there in, on the table, uh, the uh, later stage can be easily confused with Monilia because it's also black. <clears throat> and that has known to, be happen to have happened in the past. Secondly, Facetio pycnis, <coughs> uh, Washingtonensis, that's the name of this disease, the, the fungus Facetio pycnis is very common on, um, on pollinator trees, on crab apples of the golden hornet variety. Here you can see very well how overwintered fruit mummies from the previous year have given rise to inoculum which is just about to infect fruits of the current year and this is then the fungus that mummifies these fruits. Now golden hornet is a very common pollinator across Europe and again sending out um, colleagues to pick golden hornet mummies uh, we can see, we can find that this disease is common absolutely anywhere in fact, last autumn I got quite a shock when I had to go up to Bergen for a different project and I saw an orchard with golden hornet trees and I didn't find a single infected uh, fruit mummy, uh, in, a fruit mummy infected with <coughs> Facidia pycnis. Apart from that, every single orchard where we've looked, we found this disease on the, on the golden hornet pollinator trees. So if it is as widespread as this across Europe, then it must have been present for more than two or three years. So I think it has just been there and people have overlooked it. It's interesting to note 
to, to observe more closely what happens in an orchard uh, which is colonised by, uh, which has golden hornet and elster trees, such as an orchard here at uh, Orslev and also at the Esterbog Centre. So I took mummies uh, explicitly from branches of these two cultivars which were intertwining with, with each other, so which were in direct physical contact and still golden hornet was almost exclusively colonised by Phasidia pycnis, elster almost exclusively by diplodia. What could be the reason for this mutual exclusion? I think it is a temporal habitat isolation. These um, um, fruit mummies are formed at different times and then can be colonised by different fungi. Elster fruit mummies are formed in June, during the June drops, and due to a, a default in the Elster cultivar, these mummies don't drop to the ground like in mo many other varieties, but they just stay attached to the tree. Golden hornet fruit mummies are formed much later, in autumn, when the ripe fruits are colonized, are being colonized by fungi, and then these fungi mummify these fruits. Summer is a good time for Diplodia because it's a high temperature fungus. Autumn, a good time for, for Facetia pycnis because it requires much lower temperatures for infection. This is a slide which uh, Stie and Annette will recognize, I think. It was, uh, is the basis of an experiment here at Orslev. We were wondering whether golden hornet trees, the mummies of which are colonised by Phasidio pycnis, actually play a role uh, as an inoculum reservoir for Elster apples. And here Stee and Annette harvested um, fruits from individual trees and stored them separately. So one means that this Elster tree here um, was adjacent to a golden hornet uh, crab apple tree. Two means one tree, one Elster tree further away and so on. And you can see that as you move away from the golden hornet tree, uh, you see a reduced occurrence of rubbery rot in the Elster apples. So the obvious implication is that one should remove fruit mummies from golden hornet, which is fairly easily done because golden hornet trees are small and there are not so many of them. Colletotricum acutatum, another important storage rot, I did not show this gradient and I could not find it on golden hornet mummies either. While at it, we always try to generate more than one uh, set of data from an experiment. It's always hard work and uh, we were able, because there were, so, there were so many fruits naturally infected, we were able to grade them according to the route of entry. So a uh, face pycnis can enter through, the, through virtually any opening which the apple fruit has, through the blossom end, through the stalk end and also through wounds or through lenticels. And artificial infection experiments, which uh, Hinrich Holthus and I have been conducting in, in northern Germany, indicate that it is the last two or three weeks before harvest during which these infections take place. I don't want to dwell on literature which has been written on, uh, which I've written on various pathogens, but this one uh, gives me pleasure because it is always nice when you develop, when you discover new disease to introduce new names into languages. And I can boast to have added the name rubbery rot to four languages. Uh, English, Gimirot in Danish, Gumowata in Polish, it's actually the only Polish word I know, um, <laughs> and Gummifeule in, in German. So that has been a bit of a pleasure uh, to do. I will conclude now by summarizing some of the features of Facidio Pycnus which are of relevance to us for the remainder of our event today because we are going successively to focus on the storage rot story and on ways to control storage rots. Facetio pycnis, although it's a new fungus, does have several features, features which are typical of storage rots. First of all, inoculum is present within the apple trees. Okay, in this case, crab apples, but never mind. Fruit infections occur shortly before harvest. That's very common, a very common feature of many of these storage rots. The infections then don't develop into an outright rot, but they enter a phase of latency, uh, either as spores themselves or as promycelium on or in the fruit skin. And then the rot, the outbreak of the rot is delayed until the fruit um, matures further during storage. We can look at um, certain features which can encourage or influence the formation of storage rots and I'm going to use that as a kind of uh, index for the next few presentations which are to follow. Before planting, by choosing varieties, you can influence the occurrence of storage rots later. Elstar is very susceptible to storage rots, Jonah Gold, for example, isn't. The location is also an obvious factor. If you have a very damp location, you'll get more storage rots. Chemical control is possible both in integrated and in organic production, using the registered fungicides, but they are not very effective 
as we'll see later. Mechanical control against certain rots, you can achieve something by canker pruning. Apple canker is a disease which infects the bark of trees, and we do see an increase of nectaria storage rot in heavily cankered trees. And fruit lime removal, I've mentioned sufficiently, I think. The biodiversity of rots can differ, as, uh, as we will see, between different orchards. And if we know which diseases are present in our orchards, then we can manage them more specifically. The weather is a factor which uh, also has a certain uh, influence on storage rots. We can even perform or conduct chemical control measures after harvest. One methylcyclopropene has to be um, considered as a chemical control measure, although it's not directed against the rot, but just against delaying maturity of the apple fruit. But by delaying maturity, um, you also delay the outbreak of fruit rots. And it is possible to drench apples in fungicides. It's not registered in Germany at the moment, but it is possible and it's very highly effective. You can save on several fungicide sprays before harvest by just drenching the apples once after harvest. It's not considered cricket currently, but all the same, it's possible. And of course, non-chemical control is an option, uh, and we are going to focus quite extensively on hot water treatment um, later on. By manipulating storage conditions, and I'm happy to see my colleague Dirk Köpke here, uh, he is a, a wizard at um, manipulating storage conditions. He can store apples for two years or more, and they are still edible. Um, and of course, you can, also delay, you can also delay the outbreak of fruit rots in the process. And you can do something at the point of sale. Uh, and that's uh, an advice we, which we give to all our farmers. You sell the last picked fruits first. So the second and third pickings are more likely to develop fruit rots and they have to be um, sold first. It's a bit of a paradoxical situation, but the first pickings are sold last. And we're going to look at um, some of these factors uh, from now on in a little more detail in our seminar today. I'm going to look at the biodiversity of rots. I'm going to explain them briefly which we need to know for uh, evaluating hot water treatments. Merete Edelenbos and I are going to focus on different aspects of the hot water treatment itself. But Marianne Bertelsen is going to make a start by showing us something which I didn't expect I would ever live to see, manipulating the weather. <laughs> so Marianne, <laughs> over to you. Thank you.